Amen. Thank you. We are continuing our survey of the Bible, in particular the Old Testament, and beyond that, especially the books of prophecy. We've been on these books for several months now. All of the books of prophecy were written by prophets who lived and worked after the time of the divided kingdom. And thus far we've looked at the prophet Joel and Jonah and Amos and Hosea and Micah and Isaiah and Nahum. And last week we looked at Zephaniah. Zephaniah and Habakkuk are, and Jeremiah are the three last writing prophets in the years immediately preceding the Babylonian captivity. As we know from our examination of the historical books, the Babylonians cop conquered the southern kingdom on three different occasions. They first came in 605, conquered the southern kingdom, carried Daniel away into captivity, uh, but didn't destroy the temple, didn't destroy Jerusalem, and left most of the men and women there in Jerusalem. Uh, Jeremiah, who was one of the, probably the, the dominant prophet at this period of time, urged the people to repent of their sins. If they repented, uh, the Babylonians wouldn't come back. Also, he urged them to obey the Babylonians because the Babylonians had been raised up by God to punish the Jews for their sins. So to rebel against the Babylonians was to rebel against God's instrument of judgment. So that is a foolish thing to do. Stop rebelling, acquiesce, but they didn't. <laughs> so the Babylonians, they're stubborn the way we are. So the Babylonians came back again in 597. On this occasion, they took Ezekiel off to captivity. Daniel in 605, Ezekiel in 597, and Jeremiah gave the same message. Listen, God raised up the Babylonians to push you for your sins, clean up your act, obey them, and nothing worse will happen. But they continued to rebel, so finally the Babylonians came back in 586 and reconquered Judah, and this time they destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and carried essentially the entire population back to Babylon in captivity. So we date the Babylonian captivity in 586, because that's when the really enormous things happen. Now, there are three prophets, as I pointed out, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and Jeremiah, who were the three major writing prophets in these years immediately preceding the Babylonian captivity. Last week we looked at Zephaniah. Zephaniah was that remarkable prophet who ushered young King Josiah into godliness, and through him a a revival of sorts in the years immediately preceding the Babylonian captivity. But uh, young Josiah died in 509, and the people fell back into the sinful behavior. And four years later, the Babylonians came in 605 and, re and conquered the southern kingdom. The second uh, prophet that we, and the prophet we'll be looking at this evening, is the prophet Habakkuk. Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and Jeremiah were all concerned about the Babylonian captivity. Habakkuk however, was concerned about a bigger issue. And I want to talk about Habakkuk this evening, but I want to give you sort of a brief overview of this man and give you, so give you a little perspective on him, and then we'll go back and examine him in detail. <clears throat> There's a fancy theological term called theodicy. And theodicy is uh, 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 the doctrine of defending the goodness of God against... Uh, a world in which evil exists. What am I getting at? How many times have you heard people say, how could a holy and righteous and loving God have allowed the Holocaust? How, or how could a holy and righteous God allow Boko Haram in Nigeria, that militant Muslim group, to go in and capture young, those hundreds of young uh, Christian schoolgirls and then cart them off and, and make them work in sexual slavery? How could a holy God? What about China, where millions of Christians are being persecuted? So often when something terrible happens, uh, people say, how could a loving God allow that? Now, if he wasn't all-powerful, we could understand it. But he is all-powerful. He's all-powerful, loving God, and he allows this stuff to take place. And uh, the Bible, in the Bible, God defends himself against that accusation. He defends himself against that issue of why he allows it. And the theological term is theodicy. And Habakkuk is a theodicy. It's a, it's a book in which God defends himself against uh, the charge that somehow there's something wrong with him, and he's less than loving simply because he allows the wicked to reign. In Habakkuk's case, it's this. 
Habakkuk looked around Israel and he said, you know what? All the wicked people are rich and powerful and influential and they crush the righteous. And then he looked at the righteous and he said, they're poor and they're weak and they're put upon and they have no influence. God, why are you allowing this? I know you love righteousness. I know you're holy. You love righteousness. You hate sin. I know you're all powerful. Why do you allow this to happen? And that's his first question. How could you let that happen? Just like us in the Holocaust and Boko Haram. And God says, he answers him and says, I'm raising up the Babylonians to punish Israel for the reign of wickedness, uh, the reign of the wicked in your country. In other words, I see, I know those wicked people out there. I know what they're doing. They're rich, they're powerful, they're, 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 they're exploiting the poor. I'm going to raise up the Babylonians to punish them. Habakkuk listens to that and says, wait a minute. They're more wicked than we are. If you're going to punish anybody, you ought to be punishing the Babylonians. We're bad. And this nation was bad. Most of these prophets recognized they weren't deluded by the wickedness of their nation. We are a wicked nation. We don't have much justice. We're, we're idolatrous. We, we, our, our judges are corrupt. We're exploiting the poor. It's bad. We're bad. We should be punished. But, God, the Babylonians are worse than us. You should be punishing them. And that was his second question. And he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into the watchtower and wait for an answer. That's the reason the memory aid is watchtower. <laughs> because, uh, and so God answered him. And God answered him by saying, to begin with, look at the destiny of the wicked. Their destiny is crummy. We know their destiny. What is their destiny? Lake of fire. So, okay, for a season, they're on top of things, but in the end, they go down the tubes. So don't get too bent out of shape because they have a season where they win at this game called life. But the other, that was answer number one. Answer number two was, the righteous will live by faith. Now, we all know that expression, don't we? Because it's the foundation of the doctrine of justification by faith apart from works of any sort for salvation. Paul picked up this phrase from Habakkuk and built that, made that the theme for the book of Romans, the greatest dissertation in the Bible on the doctrine of justification by faith. So his, his answer was justification by faith. What does that mean in the case of Habakkuk? It means, trust me. How about that? Trust me. I'm not going to tell you why I'm allowing all this to happen. But if you're righteous, you'll trust me. And that, in a sense, is what God is telling you and me. We live in a world filled with wickedness and evil. It's disgusting. The judicial sense, and our country's best, better than most of them. But it's wicked out there. Horrible things are happening. And we say, why would you allow that? God says, trust me. I know what I'm doing. Now, we trust him with our souls. He's saying, trust me when I say, I know what I'm doing when I allow these things to take place. That's the ultimate answer to all these questions. God says, I am big, I'm powerful, I really am smart. <laughs> and I have a game plan, and I'm working it out, so trust me. That's a brief overview of Habakkuk. Uh, I'm going to fill in a few details now, otherwise you can go home. But I want to give you the overall view of this man, because he's not really so concerned about the Babylonians coming the way Jeremiah and Zephaniah are, but he's, he's in a, he's, his book is a theodicy. He's trying to help us understand what, why. He doesn't really tell us why God allows evil to exist. He just gives us God's answer to that question, which is, trust me, I know what I'm doing. And uh, so that's the wise course of action to take. With that, let's just go start going through here. Uh, Habakkuk, is pointed out, was one of three writing prophets in the years preceding the Babylonian captivity. Here's a watchtower. A watchtower was a structure, a tower, that was usually built outside the city walls in this, of the cities in antiquity. And uh, sentinels and guards would go up into the watchtower 
to look out over the land to see when the enemy armies were coming. And there were often enemy armies coming. So a watchtower was a place for sentinels and guards and watchmen to dwell so they have a good view of what was happening around the city. So he was one of three writing prophets in the years preceding the Babylonian captivity. The revival under Josiah was short-lived. Remember we talked last week in the book of Zephaniah about how Zephaniah ushered young King Josiah into being a godly man, ushering, and he in turn brought about a revival in Israel. But it was short-lived. As soon as uh, he died, the people went back to their same old wickedness. Typical. Habakkuk was troubled by the evil he saw. He knew that God is holy and righteous and hates sin. He knew that God had the power to stop the sin. But God was allowing sin to continue. Yes, we went through that. Habakkuk is a theodicy, a defense of God's goodness in view of the existence of evil. He is still good, even though he allows evil to exist. How, we ask, can a good God allow so much terrible sin and evil to exist? That's the question men have been asking. Sadly, people have walked away from the faith because something terrible happens. Uh, a sister is raped. A young girl is, is, and sometimes these are brutal, horrible things happen. And, 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 and we say, God, how could you allow that to happen? If you allow that to happen, I want nothing to, you, to do with you. And God is saying, don't do that. Trust me. He doesn't explain. One day, I think we will understand more about what's going on. God really does not give us an answer to that question apart from the righteous will what? Live by faith. In other words, I'm trying to expand on that. We understand the doctrine of justification by faith. We understand that when it comes to salvation. But God is saying, it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. When this, this issue about how a loving and righteous God can allow sin to prevail, God's answer is, the righteous will what? Live by faith. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. And the truth is, salvation demands that we trust God. God. Salvation demands that we trust God. God is saying, I took care of your sin problem. That's our problem, isn't it? A long time ago, our grandparents, Adam and Eve, sinned. They blew it big time. And when they sinned, we sinned with them. So we have this problem called sin that prevents us from having the relationship with God that we need to have. It also destines us to the lake of fire. God says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to come down, become, become a man, and take your punishment upon myself in the person of Jesus Christ. And not only that, I want to give you my righteousness. So I want to take your sin, pay the punishment, for, take all the punishment you deserve for your sinful behavior, and give you my righteousness, and I'll do this whole package by faith. Will you trust me? See, now if you don't trust him to do that, you're not saved. You understand? This is the only requirement. It's not obeying the law, promising to be a good guy. I'm glad about that. And it's none of that stuff. Not a little religious ritual. It's not taking communion. It's not like getting baptized. It's not coming to church. It's none of that stuff. God says, will you trust me? When I say, I've taken care of your sin problem, I want to give you my righteousness. Will you accept this package by faith? And that requires that we what? Trust him. It requires that we really do. We have to believe him. We have to trust him. It's not inviting Jesus into your heart. I have no total, I don't really have a major quarrel with that when it comes to kids. But, you know, there are people out there who don't believe in the existence of God who invited Jesus into their hearts. It's kind of sad, folks. He actually expects you to believe that he is who he says he is, that he did for you what he, what he really did for you, and that you trust him by faith to have accomplished what was necessary. Paying for your sin. You understand what I'm getting at here? We're talking about trust. Sometimes when they talk about, when they have evangelistic meetings, they just make it really simple for people. Too simple. People are accepting Christ who don't believe in the existence of God. That's nuts. God says, you've got to trust me. And that's what we're doing here. We're, God is saying, you've got to trust me. Keep going. Question number one. Why does God allow the wicked to crush the righteous? Habakkuk, about how we're going to start reading through the passage. The oracle of Habakkuk, the prophet, received, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? This is not just a question. This is a bit of a complaint. <laughs> God put it in. He loved Habakkuk. Or cry out to you, Violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. 
The wicked him and the righteous so that justice is perverted. The wicked do him and the righteous. The him and the righteous in the judicial system, the him and the righteous in that we have almost no influence in society. We really don't. Particularly on sexual matters, on matters of abortion. I mean, it's reached a point now where uh, if you criticize the LGBT agenda, you're viewed as a narrow-minded, uneducated bigot, you're a hate monger. That's hitting us in. We don't really have an equal voice out there. In fact, poor Gary Russell, I'm not mentioning something here that he hasn't already brought up at prayer meeting. Uh, he's a, a physician for Geisinger. He's got to go through transgender training, sensitivity training. Because if you dare say something critical, you're going to be ostracized. So when what he's talking about, what Mac is talking about here, is alive and well in our day. They're hemming us in. We have very little influence. And so Habakkuk is frustrated. He looks at Israel and his society, and the wicked are prevailing. And he's frustrated. God, why are you allowing that to happen? Question number one, why does God allow the wicked to crush the righteous? The wicked are ruling. As a result, evil was reigning in Israel. The righteous were being hemmed in. There's little justice or influence. Things were getting worse and worse and worse, as they are in our society. Wickedness was going unchecked. God seemed to be indifferent. God was tolerating evil. And one could argue the same thing is going on today. God is allowing evil to prevail, is he not? In my lifetime, I've seen it get worse and worse and worse, and I fully expect it to get worse and worse and worse. And if I could put on the hat of a back for a moment, I would say, God, why are you allowing this? I'm up in my watchtower. <laughs> why are you allowing it? It is frustrating sometimes. And, but that's one of the reasons God has given us the book of Habakkuk, to help us learn how to deal with this frustration. He doesn't answer the question, folks. But he says, trust me. And that's what you've got to learn to do. You've got to get a handle. One of the things I, that, that has blessed me in my life is, I, is, is studying theology. Theology is the study of God. And the more uh, I get a handle on who God is, the more I trust him. And I would argue to anyone, if, if you're having trouble trusting God, get a good book on uh, theology proper, which is the study of God. You say, well, Al, well, how much good does that do me being a carpenter? It's good for your soul. Because the more I understand who God is and what he's all about, the easier it is for me to trust him because he's holy and he's righteous and he's all-powerful and he's really, really smart. And he really does know what he's doing and he has my best interest at heart. And he lays all this stuff out for me. And he says, okay, David, now I've given you a lot of information. Will you trust me on these issues I'm not giving you answers to? And that's a challenge to all of us. And the really godly men and women say, Lord, I trust you no matter what. No matter what. And that's where he wants us to be. That's where he wants us to be. Continuing. God answered by telling Habakkuk that the Babylonians would punish the nation. Why are you allowing all the wicked, the, the wicked to prevail? God, uh, God says, I'm, hey, I'm, I'm raising up the Babylonians to punish the nation. Habakkuk, look at the nations and watch. Be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own. This was not the answer Habakkuk wanted. He probably wanted a revival. We, he hinted at that in chapter 3. In chapter 3 he said, In wrath remember mercy. What he's getting at here is this. Habakkuk fully understood that God needed to punish the nation for its sinfulness. It was disgusting. Its leaders were corrupt. Its judges were corrupt. Idolatry was prevailing. The poor were having their faces ground into the dirt. It was horrible. The nation deserved to be punished. And I think Habakkuk, like so many of these prophets, understood the history of Israel and understood that often when Israel was in the midst of a lot of grossly sinful behavior, God would bring a drought or a plague or a famine to punish them and the people would, would stand back and repent and cry out to God. Or even bring one of the local Gentile nations against them and the people would see the threat and cry out and, and ask God to forgive them and God would forgive them and the nation would be sort of restored to a measure of righteousness. That's almost certainly what he was hoping for when he said, 
when, when he was saying in, in, in uh, remember mercy, what was it he had here? In, in wrath, remember mercy. He was looking for God to deal with, discipline the nation, but he didn't want Babylon to come against him because he knew the Babylonians would wipe them out. So when God said, I'm raising up the Babylonians, uh, back is, that's not exactly the answer I wanted. Raise up the Ammonites, maybe, or the Philistines, and they'll come in and we'll get bent out of shape and we'll cry out to you for, and, and repent and ask for forgiveness and we'll clean up our act a little bit. Now, this is not what he was looking for. Question number one, why does God allow the wicked to crush the righteous? God's answer by telling, answered by telling Habakkuk that the Babylonians would punish the nation, which raised the second question. Why does God allow the more wicked to punish the lesser wicked? We could ask that question today in Europe. Why does God allow missile, uh, militant Islam to punish Europe, and it's punishing Europe. That's the folks in Germany. There are areas in, in, in Germany that are no-go areas, and in Britain as well. And things like that are going to be happening in our country. God is raising up people in many ways more wicked than we. Militant Islam is pretty horrible. And yet God is using them to punish us because this is not a righteous country anymore. Habakkuk, oh Lord, you are not... Are you not from everlasting, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. Habakkuk was reminding himself that God would not break the covenant with Abraham, with his covenant with Abraham, and allow the whole nation to be killed. Continuing, O Lord, you have appointed them, Babylonians, to execute judgment. O Rock, you have ordained them, talking about the Babylonians, to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked, talking about the Babylonians, swallow up those Israelites more righteous than themselves? You're raising up people who are worse than we are. We need to be punished, but why with these folks? Habakkuk is having a tough time. <laughs> why would God allow sinful leaders to reign in Israel and therefore make it a sinfully wretched nation? And why would God raise up the more sinful Babylonians to punish them? Habakkuk climbed into his watchtower. Now is when he climbs into his watchtower to wait for God's answer. Reading in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 1, I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. God's answer, the wicked will come to ruin, the righteous will live by faith. Trust me. I know, he doesn't get it, but give me an answer to my question. No, it doesn't work that way. You got to trust me. You got to trust me. And that's, that's tough sometimes. Habakkuk, look at the proud. They trust themselves and their lives are crooked. And because of that crooked life, they're going down the tubes. But the righteous will live by faith. Continuing, what sorrow awaits you, you who build cities? And I was talking about how the rich the wicked will come to ruin. What sorrow awaits you who build cities with money gained through murder and corruption? Has not the Lord of heaven's armies promised that the wealth of the nations will turn to ashes? They work so hard, but all in vain. In other words, all those wicked, wealthy people who are building all this stuff, it's all going to come to ruin. It's all going to come to ruin. But soon it will be your turn to be disgraced. Talking about the wicked. Come drink and be exposed. Drink the cup of God's judgment and all your glory will be turned to shame. So what was his answer? His answer was, the wicked will come to ruin, and trust me, trust me. I'm, I have to break this down, because this, I'm sharing with you what I went through, because I looked at all this, and it grieves me. And if you're a news junkie, like some of us, you read about lots of really incredibly horrible things. How, I mean, you know, this, the nine-year-old girl that was, that was brutally raped by half a dozen horrible men who then throw her body in a sewer. And stuff like this, you say, well, th that's an exaggeration. No, it isn't. It isn't at all. Horrible things like that are going on all the time everywhere. And you say, God, I, I know you hate it. I know he hates it. And you're all powerful. You can stop it. But he doesn't stop it. And so how do you deal with that? God says, trust me. Okay. The righteous will live by faith. That's a nice theological expression. Just trust me, okay? God's answer, the wicked will come to reign, and the righteous will live by faith. 
going back down. God's answer to Habakkuk is one of the greatest statements in Scripture. The righteous will live by faith, or men will be justified by faith justified by faith or trust God and live. These are just different ways of expressing the same idea. Paul built the theme of Romans from that simple expression. Romans 1. I'm not ashamed, Paul wrote. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because this is is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, The righteous will live by faith. He quoted Habakkuk and built this entire book really around that simple sentence. Men receive the righteousness of God that God provides through faith. Trust me, I've taken care of your sin problem. I want to give you my righteousness. Accept it by faith. But you've got to believe it. This whole idea of, of inviting Jesus into your heart and getting saved without believing this stuff doesn't cut it. So when you're out evangelizing, Start with, first of all, there's a God, and the God who exists is the God of the Scriptures, and this is what the deal is. You're a sinner. God loves you. He provided a means for you to escape the consequences of sin, and then you go through and explain. There's a certain amount of explanation that's necessary. I remember in the Jesus movement, what was passed for evangelism was a joke. A man comes up to a guy on the street corner who's having sort of a miserable life and says, ah... Would you like to be happy? Oh, of course I'd like to be happy. Would you like to live forever? Well, yeah. Well, invite Jesus into your heart. Folks, that's not evangelism. You hear me screaming because this guy walks away thinking he's saved. He's not saved. He doesn't. He may or may not believe in God. He may or may not believe in Jesus. He invited him into his heart. So what we're talking about here is you've got to believe this stuff. You don't have to be a theologically sophisticated I don't want to make it more difficult than it is, but there's some stuff that has to be believed. You've got to say, God, I trust you to have taken care of my sin problem. I trust you when you say, you came to earth as a God-man, Jesus Christ. You took the penalty I deserve on Calvary's cross, and through faith, through faith, I get the benefits of what you did. I get the benefit of having my sins forgiven. I get the benefit of having your righteousness, a way of righteousness. I believe you. I trust you. That's salvation. Okay. Men receive the righteousness that God provides through faith. Habakkuk was grieved because the wicked were successful in life. This is a quick review. The righteous suffered in life. He asked God why, and God answered, the wicked will come to ruin, the righteous will live by faith. Trust me. Now, Habakkuk's not the only man who was frustrated with this problem of the rich doing so, uh, the wicked doing so well, and the righteous doing so badly. And he wrote a psalm. It's called the Fret Not Psalm. Uh, three times in the psalm, he talks to us who look at how well the, the wicked are doing and how poorly the righteous are doing, and we fret. And uh, that's what was happening to Habakkuk, wasn't it? And so we'll we'll explore just a little bit of what David had to say. We won't spend much time on this. Three times David tells us to not fret when the wicked are successful. When the wicked are successful, don't let it gnaw at you. Don't let it inflame you. Don't let it eat away at you. And because he's the point he's going to get at, because it'll lead to evil if you're not careful. Do not fret because evil men, because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It it, it leads only to what? Now, this is God to us. I know that you see the wicked out there doing really well. And I know that you see a lot of righteous people not doing so well. Don't fret. Don't fret. Don't fret. Because if he's not careful... It will lead to evil. Now, David doesn't tell us what the evil is, but the writer of the 37th Psalm does. David tells us to not fret when the wicked succeed. Fretting over success of the wicked can only lead to sin. In Psalm 37, he says, Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil. In Psalm 37, did I get that? It's 73. Let me check. 
I, uh, I don't think I'm dyslexic. Maybe I'm going dyslexic. What does it have? 37, 37, 37, 37. It's 73. It should be, this, it's Psalm 73. So this Psalm 37 is, the David's, is, is the threat not Psalm. And David says, don't fret because it only leads to evil. And in Psalm 73, this man named A- Asaph tells us that the evil it can lead to is discouragement. And the idea here is that you're living a righteous life. You're doing everything. You're not being self-righteous. You're just trying to do what God wants you to do. You're following the commandments as best you can. You know, you're, 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 you're tithing. You're teaching your kids how to live righteous lives. You yourself are being righteous, living a righteous life. You're doing all that. And, but your business just failed. And your young daughter just died. Your wife's not happy with you. And meanwhile, you look across the way, and your wicked neighbor's really doing well. And I've heard people, basically, in situations like that when their life is falling apart. I remember a friend once whose wife left. I don't understand. I, you know, I'm a Christian. I, I, I live for the Lord. I do my best. And he wasn't being self-righteous. And my life falls apart. I look at my neighbors who don't give two hoots about God. Their kids are healthy. Their wives uh, are faithful. And my wife runs off with this guy. He said, what good was it being righteous? They become discouraged. And when you fret about the wicked doing well, when you who are trying to live a righteous life are not doing well, you can become very discouraged. Why am I living a righteous life? And that's what Asaph is talking about in Psalm 73, dyslexic David. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. He didn't slip but they almost did i had nearly lost my foothold for i envied the arrogant when i saw the prosperity of the wicked he continues they the wicked seem now this is from the new living translation which is a little raw but i like the way he put it here they the wicked seem to live such painless lives their bodies are so healthy and strong they don't have troubles like other people they're not plagued with, the prob- with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats, now you would never get that in the King James <laughs> or the NIV. I'm not knocking either one. You've got to go to the living for this, <laughs> uh, the new living. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride, they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens, and their words strut throughout the earth. And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people, enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. He's fretting. He's fretting. Continuing, did I keep my heart pure for nothing? This is the problem. Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings pain. The wicked, they live horrible lives. They're doing well. Me, I tried to keep my heart pure for, for what? Nothing. I kept myself innocent for no reason. It did me no good. Now this is what Asaph is saying in Psalm 73, is what fretting can lead to can lead to discouragement. It can lead you to the point where you say, what's the point of trying to live a righteous life if, 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 I'm, if, if I can't do at least as well as the wicked? But the problem is the righteous almost never do as well as the, rich, as the, as the wicked. And it's a little easier in our society, but in antiquity, forget it. And in Israel, forget it. Continuing, Dave, back, back to David, Psalm 37. Do not fret because... The wicked are successful. Three times David tells us to not fret when the wicked are successful. Fretting, he said, over the successes of the wicked can lead us into sin. And Asaph taught us about that. David tells us two ways to avoid fretting over the successes of the wicked. One, he reminds us that the destiny of the wicked is horrible. He's all, we already read about that. Keep this in mind. All those people, that, those wicked people, so well, while you're not doing so well, their end is a disaster. And really, The trick in succeeding in life is the last chapter. That's really the trick in succeeding. We we come this way, you know, I popped out of my mother's womb in 1941. 
I don't know how much long I'm going to be here, but I know that sometime between then and the time I die, I've got to figure out life. <laughs> really, you've got to figure it out, what's going on. And in the scriptures, God gives us a good explanation of what's going on. And really what you want to do is win at life. And there's only one way to win, and that's through Jesus Christ. Those wicked men and women who are doing so well here end up, the last chapter is eternity in the lake of fire. The last chapter for the believer is glorious. And that's what he's saying here. Okay, don't be, why be so envious don't, uh, of the wicked? Yeah, they're doing well, but it's only for a short season, and the last chapter in their life is horrible. The last chapter for the righteous is wonderful. So keep, that's a perspective that helps. And then he says, even though not, God's not going to give you the answer why he's allowing all that wicked to prevail, focus your attention on God. Recognize that the last chapter in your life is going to be glorious. The last chapter in all those horrible people out there that are doing horrible things, we see them every night on TV, their destiny is horrible. So give them a break. Let them have a moment of glory in the sun. Our glory is, going, is coming. So the destiny of the wicked is horrible. Focus your attention on God. Delight yourself in the Lord, David wrote, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Recognize that the last chapter of the wicked is horrible. The last chapter of your life is good. Reason enough to hang in and trust God. And that's all through trusting God, by the way. And thou focus on the Lord. Delight yourself in him. If you focus on the Lord, life is a whole lot easier. Pure and simple. If you start looking at yourself and all the shortcomings and the problems, it's a disaster. Because we all have problems. I mean, a few words and we'll close. Living in this wicked and sinful world is often a frustrating experience for a Christian. And one of the greatest frustrations is because the wicked with their obsessions with wickedness reign, while the righteous with their, des with their desire for righteousness suffer. Why, we cry out in frustration, why, dear Lord, why do you allow the sinful and the wicked to reign and the righteous to be crushed? Why do you allow the bad guys to win and the good guys to lose? Lord, you tell us in Romans chapter 13 that, this is a tough one, there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. That means Joseph Stalin and Russia. That means Adolf Hitler and Germany. Get real, folks. This is what you've got to deal with. You want fake Christianity, you want the real stuff. But God says, but the only answer to this question is what? The destiny of the, of the wicked is horrible. The destiny of the righteous is wonderful. So the last, their last chapter is horrible. That's the last chapter. That's all they'll ever know. Our last chapter is wonderful. That's all we'll ever know. That's the A part. The second part, of the, the second answer is what? Trust me, I really do know what I'm doing. You know what? I think he does, don't you? I really believe he does know what he's doing. So I'm going to trust him. And see, it doesn't require trust when you have all the answers. If I have all the answers, I don't require any trust. On this issue, I don't have an answer. Why does God, God allow that nine-year-old girl to be brutally raped and murdered by a gang of thugs? I don't have the answer to that. God says, trust me. This is requires trust. This requires trust. And if you want to be a godly man or woman, you've got to trust God. You've got to trust him. So why we cry out in frustration? Why, dear Lord, why do you allow the sinful and wicked to reign and the righteous to be crushed? Why do you allow the bad guys to win and the good guys to lose? Lord, you tell us in Romans chapter 13 that there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. If this is the case, dear Lord, why do you let so many bad guys win elections and so many good guys lose elections? Happens all the time, every November. Why do you let so many bad guys rule so much of the world and so few good guys rule? These are, these are honest questions. Why, dear Lord, do you allow the wicked to crush the righteous and they're crushing the righteous all over the world? For thousands of years, think of ISIS and all those Christians that were out on, on, on the... On the uh, um, uh, and the waterfront, the uh, the beach front, yeah, thank you, and all beheaded. Remember, why? God says what? What's the answer? Trust me. 
For thousands of years, godly men and women have been asking these same questions. For thousands of years, godly men and women have been frustrated because they know that the God of the universe is a holy and righteous God who hates sin, and they know that God could crush the wicked and establish righteousness and do so in a nanosecond. But he doesn't. Why, they ask, why? This is it. The scriptures give us a number of answers to this question. But 2,600 years ago, a prophet named Habakkuk was frustrated in much the same way as we are frustrated. So he asked God to answer these same questions, and God gave him the ultimate answer to this question. Trust me. I know exactly what I'm doing. Or the righteous will live by faith. And you're saying, David, I thought you were going to give us the answer. <laughs> this, is, this is God's answer. But this is what you've got to come to terms with. And as things get worse and worse and worse, and we see our societies in the West start collapsing, the way Venezuela is collapsing, and if you don't think so, that could happen here, folks, you're not reading the Bible. You're actually not reading the Wall Street Journal. It's bad. And things start going down, and we see our own children starved to death and things like this. It's going to get tough. And a lot of folks are going to walk away from the faith, and God tells us that, that frankly, when tough times come, end times come, folks, people will walk away from the faith because they never learn to trust God, to know exactly what he's doing. He proved himself, as far as I'm concerned, on Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago. He said, David, I'm going to take all the filth that you are responsible for. I'm going to pay the penalty for that and give you forgiveness and righteousness if you trust me. You know what? That's what you got to live with. The righteous will live by faith. If you do that, you'll make it through the tough times. If you don't, sadly, you won't. And you, the sad thing is going to be when the tough times come, there are going to be a lot of Christians, millions, fade, because they haven't come to terms with this, which is why I spent a lot of time on Habakkuk. We'll go on to something more exciting next week, Lord willing. Jeremiah. Yeah, a whole lot more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> the weeping prophet. If you think things are bad, it's going to get worse. <laughs> Father, we love you. We worship. What a great God you are. And we, have, we are a room full of people who trust you. You all together, trustworthy. That's the reason we can trust you, because you're trustworthy. And we thank you for doing so much for us. Help us to live lives that are more pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray.